By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back to the Paladins of the North Cup. We have reached the quarterfinals. Man, I'm so looking forward to this match. And in the quarterfinals, we're going to see two top wizards going a mano a mano. It is uh, Dion with his two to core deck. His deck is completely consistent out of um, core set cards. He's taking on Ron and he's playing his famous Rook Valley deck. I mean, he's had top results with this deck and I just can't wait to show both of these decks to you. But before I do, I would just like to mention that if you wanna skip the whole deck tech phase, if you wanna skip the introduction, the easiest way to do that is by checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps one of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, that will take you straight to the games. And uh, also, if you want to go to a specific deck tech video, there are timestamps there as well. If you want more information about the rules, again, check the description below. It's all there. Okay, and um, after this message, I guess we're ready to dive into the decks. I'm going to start with the deck of D. I've called it To Decor. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of D. Now I've called it to the core for obvious reasons, right? There are only core set cards in here. All the cards here are from Alpha, Beta. And one of the things I like about this is that Dion is showing us you don't need those key cards from the Four Horsemen sets. It's not necessary. I mean, we've been talking a lot, our people have been talking a lot about uh, um, a Mishra's Factory, right? Like, should you add it in every deck or not? Um, it's a boring card, it's too strong, all that stuff, all those arguments. Um, but I think, yes, it's a very good card, and yes, it works great in a lot of decks, but also don't overestimate it. Try to take them out once in a while, see how your deck runs without them. Try to put two in, try to put three in. You know, always try to think, what do I want to do with my deck, and what's the role of the Mishra's Factory in this deck? And, and yes, in a lot of cases, your answer will be, I'm going to play them, but there will also be moments where you'll probably be surprised and, and find out your deck is better without them. Anyway, that's kind of my little speech about Mishra's Factory. Of course, it's all up to you in the end. Do whatever you like. Um, let's zoom into the deck of Dion. We've looked at this deck before, and one of the things that I've mentioned that I'm going to mention again, that's a creature base, which I think is really good. He's got those Savannah lines for aggression, then he's got the Setch Troll, which is basically a four drop, right? Because you don't want to play it out before you can regenerate it, but it's just a lot of value, you know? It's three mana, it's a three, three. Um, you know, you want to keep a black open to regenerate it, so it's, it's really difficult to kill for your opponent if your opponent is not playing with any swords. And guess what? Ron is not playing with any sword, so that's going to be really nice for him. Um, then we see kind of the upper end of his creature base. We see three Sarah Angels, so that's quite a lot. And we also see a mighty Shivan Dragon. And I'm kind of liking the Shivan because of that five toughness, you know, and it's flying, so it's really good evasion. I think in this matchup, it could do really, really well if it's played out at the right time. It can really win you a game. Um, obviously, in, this deck has a lot of things in common in a way with the line dip deck and what I mean by that is this deck wants to especially at the start of the game just play out like a cheap lion and then just keep mana open to do stuff like to power sync to disenchant to cyblast to bolt you know all these kind of options you want to keep those open you don't want to tap out too much uh, we also see of course an armageddon here which if well time can give you the game as well you know if you're ahead on board uh, a time uh, played at Armageddon and then, you know, finish the job. Remember, he's also playing with a lot of direct damage, right? Four bolts and four side blasts. I mean, that alone, that is 28 points of direct damage. So with direct damage alone, he can already win the game. Again, something I've mentioned before, I'm just going to mention it again for people that are seeing this deck for the first time. He's not playing with Swords to Plowshares main. So he's really made a decision to kill creatures or, or via combat, you know, the old fashioned way, or by using direct damage, lightning bolt, side blast, right? He's not gonna, um, he's not gonna use his swords to plowshares for that. He does have two in the sideboard though, and he could bring them in. I think against the Rook Valley deck, the swords to plowshares can be really good uh, to play. For example, against the Rook X because it removes them from the game, and then Ron doesn't get a four four flyer. So that could be a consideration for him to board those in from his sideboard. He's also playing with Terror. I think Terror would be a great inclusion here. 
uh, for this matchup because his opponent is not playing well, hardly playing with any artifact creatures. There's actually one Suchi in his list that he then cannot target with the Terror, but he can target the Atox, he can target the Bird Tokens, he can target the Rook X, so there's plenty of choices. Obviously, he also cannot target the Mishra's Factory, so that is... But, I mean, he's got decent chance for that and bolts for that. So, so that's not a big problem, I think. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's just a solid list, right? We see, of course, the blue power in here. We basically see all the power pieces that's making this deck, of course, extra strong. And, um, yeah, what more can I say about it? I think it's it's still admirable that a corset deck uh, makes it to top eight. And, I mean, D has done it uh, multiple times, so it's not a coincidence anymore. It's just... Yeah, he's just really, really good at playing this deck. Okay, this is the deck of D. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Rook Valley by Ron. And here we see the deck Rook Valley by Ron. Okay, so it's obviously named after the two cards Diamond Valley, a land from the Arabian Nights expansion. You can tap it to sacrifice target creature you own, and then you gain life equal to the toughness of the creature. And that works really, really well with uh, Rook Egg. Rook Egg being an 0-3 creature, and when it goes to the graveyard, you get a 4-4 bird token at the end of the turn, right? So you can sack your Rook Egg to the Diamond Valley, gain 3 life, and at the end of turn, you get a 4-4 bird token. There's another card that goes really well here with the Rook Egg, and that is Chain Lightning. Chain Lightning is a sorcery from Legends. For 1 red, you can deal 3 damage to any target, and then the owner of that target uh, can pay 2 more red to make a Lightning Chain and to deal 3 damage to any target of his choice and then your opponent can do that over and over and over again so you can create this chain. Now the cool thing is if you target your own stuff, like if Ron targets his own Rook Egg, he can pay 2 red again to choose another target to deal 3 damage to. So he gets extra value out of his Chain Lightning. So Chain Lightning and Rook Egg is also a very good combination. Now besides this being a Rook Valley deck, it's also kind of an Atok deck, right? We see 3 Atoks in here and um atok of course goes really well with all the moxen we see there all the power is in this deck by the way just like with d's deck so you know moxen go great with atox and also black vices go great with atox because it basically means whenever an artifact somewhere in the game has kind of run out of its use you can feed it to the atox and it's like this mini power bump and why it's so difficult to play against Atok is that, you know, when Ron has enough artifacts on the board and he's got an Atok and he says, you know what, I'm going to attack with the Atok. You think, okay, if I'm going to let it go through, he can sack blah, 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 so many artifacts. He can deal 10 damage out of nowhere. But if I'm going to block it, I don't really want to do that because then he's just sacking, let's say, a Black Vice and a Mox he doesn't need. And he can kill one of my top creatures, like my Sarah Angel, for example. So it's really... An ATOC kind of makes it more difficult for your opponent, right, to make a decision. Also, when you use your direct damage on the ATOC, you can always respond by sacking a couple of artifacts and keeping it alive. So it's it's just a tricky creature to play against. And, you know, I remember when we had an ATOC bin because people really didn't like that creature. And you could just get your ATOC for free or dump it here. That was what it said on, on the bin. And it was just a garbage bin and everybody would toss their ATOCs in. And, and, and look at Atok now, you know, it's it's a super good creature. It's used in some of the top tier decks and also in this one. And um, yeah, it's just it's kind of interesting to see that evolution of, of Atok. So um, just looking at the deck as a whole, we also see a lot of direct damage in the deck of Ron. So that's something that he's got in common with D. So, I mean, both of these players can kind of win out of nowhere with their direct damage. So that makes it a very uh, risky, um, yeah, a very risky matchup for both players i think you know if ron can just get some early damage in with the vices and with the draw sevens that would be really good for him because he is playing with yeah he is playing with wheel of fortune and with time twister so that's always a nice combination as well black vice with wheel of fortune and time twister uh both players are also playing with the uh, common black splash by the way i haven't really mentioned that mind twist and a demonic tutor so that's something to keep in mind for both players as well you know they're playing with and mind twist and balance and that sometimes makes it difficult like i remember playing against these decks and thinking should i play my hand out no because he can play a balance and wipe all my creatures i don't want to overcommit. but should i keep the cards in my hand no because he's playing black so he's probably going to cast a mind twist so mind twist balance is always a tricky combo to play against and i think it's fair here because both players are playing it so i mean this promises to be quite an interesting matchup okay we've talked about the deck of d we've talked about the deck of ron so that means only one thing we are ready to get into the match let's take a look at this quarterfinals of the paladins of the north cup 
Game number one, here we go. We've got D sitting on the left, Ron sitting on the right. It looks like both players are keeping their hands. D playing with his corset deck. It's white, it's blue, it's red. It's got the little black splash for Mind Twist and Demonic Tutor. And Ron is playing with the same colors, I believe, and also has that black splash for Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. But he is playing with a completely different deck. He's playing a Rook Valley deck. So we're gonna see Rook Eggs, Diamond Valleys, and also Atox in there. Very good start here by D, by the way. Double Mox. Let's see if he can follow that up next turn. He is missing a red, though, for a potential set troll. There we see a Black Vice by Ron. That Black Vice is not going to do that much. Because D has already uh, quite emptied his hand with that double Mox play in turn number one. So no damage for him here. And playing another land. It is a red source. So are we going to see a set troll? The thing is, if he plays the set, he doesn't have black mana open to regenerate. He's not doing anything, just passing turns. So no Savannah Lines, no Setch Troll, and no uh, Sarah Angel. And D is taking it serious. Look at him zip on the water. He's super focused. And Ron has a beer there. He's playing a plateau and passing turn. Obviously not attacking. I mean, you don't want to run into a disenchant or a bolt. There is an Ancestral Recall, yeah, really nothing Ron can do here. I mean, he's got no blue mana open to counter. He doesn't even play any counter spells, I believe. So three cards drawn here by D. Beautiful Beta Ancestral Recall. I mean, the collection of both of these players are just insane. You can see D here going through his hand. Obviously now he has refilled, so that means the Vice could do some work potentially. Playing a Mox Ruby here. Looking at his options. Maybe his hand is just full of direct damage. Remember, he's playing with four bolts and, uh, and four side blasts. Looks like he is going to tap, though. You have to remember, this is the quarterfinal, so both players have already been playing the entire day. I believe this started at, was it 10.30 or 11 o'clock in the morning? And, and now we're in the evening. So it's been a very long day for both players and, you know, they're, they're so far now, they don't want to make any mistakes. There we see a Black Lotus. There is a tap for three. Are we now going to see that Setch Troll? There is the Setch Troll. Now I believe it's still a 2-2 two -two because he doesn't have any black mana. He needs a black source to give it that plus one plus one bump. So now it's just a 2-2 two -two creature that he cannot even regenerate. Well, that's not true because he's got the Black Lotus he could sack, but that's not a great deal for him. Let's see what Ron can do here. He's, he's having quite a slow start. Cannot find the Moxen or the Lotus or, or the Soul Ring. But it doesn't seem to hurt him too much. Looking at his hand again and passing turn. And let's see what D can do. It looks like he wants to attack it with the set. Remember, it's just a 2-2, so he's basically signaling to Ron here, you know, if you animate your factory, I've got an answer for it, probably a bolt or a disenchant. And now let's see what else D can do. There he's playing a Savannah Lines. Okay, so he's slowly putting some more pressure on the board. And now the question is, is Ron going to respond to this? D wants to pass turn, so in the end step, Ron can still, of course, do something. Play a bolt, for example, on the lion. He could also consider playing it on the sedge, and then, of course, he's forcing D to kind of sack his lotus to regenerate it. So he's putting him in, in, in a tough choice. So I wonder what he's going to target, the sedge troll or the lion here. Looks like he's still a little bit in the tank, though. So, oh, there's a side blast instead. Interesting. That means he takes two damage from the side and a damage here from the uh, City of Brass. Yeah, he's taking it now, so he's going to go to 15. And there's a pass turn. And I think I see an Atok there on the side of Ron. Is he going to play that out? Atok could be interesting. Since the Vice seems to do very little work against uh, the deck of D. That's, of course, one of the perks when you play with uh, Black Lotus and Five Moxen, <laughs> is that when you have to play against the Vice, it's not that deadly. There we see a Mox Jet. Tapping all four. Are we going to see a Rook Egg? Would work great with the Diamond Valley that he just played out. And, oh, there's a Suchi instead. 4-4 four, four creature. 
And when it does, you get four mana. Now remember, there's no mana burn in Swedish, making Suchi even better than it already is. There's a disenchant, feeding it to the Diamond Valley, gaining four life for this, going up to 18 and passing turn. It does mean he's tapped out, though. So D can definitely attack here with the Setch Troll, dealing two points of damage. Or if he can find a Swamp, he can deal three points of damage. Nope, still no Swamp in play. So Ron's going to drop here to 16. And let's see what else D can do. No, nothing. No Sarah Angel, nothing. Remember, remember he is playing with three Sarah Angels. But uh, he doesn't have it at the moment. So no extra pressure on the board from D. I think his hand is just full of answers. There we see another Mishra's Factory. You know, and factories can definitely become a problem later in the game. I mean, they're so powerful they're difficult to deal with even though of course uh, uh, D is playing with side blasts and lightning bolts and disenchants but still especially when you have multiple factories on the board and they can start pumping each other it can just be super annoying and there's the pass turn so just three cards in hand here for Ron still have that 2-2 two -two set stroll I wonder if he wants to attack. I mean, Rano has double option to block. Tapping four here. And oh, there's an Armageddon. Oh, this is huge. This Armageddon is huge. This is a big problem for Ron. You can see him look at it thinking, oh man. Nodding his head a little bit. Of course, not happy with this. Tapping one black, it seems. Animating it. Yeah, of course, and he can at least feed it to the Diamond Valley and gain four life. At least that's something. So he's going to go back up to 20. Wow, this Armageddon. What a game changer. I mean, th th the thing that Ron is rooting for him, though, is that he's still on 20, so he's now on 18. So he's got a lot of time to get back into this. But this is, of course, a big problem for him. Is he going to find some lands? That's the first question. Or at least a Mox. Black Lotus would be nice. There we see a land. Okay, that's not too bad. Tapping for one red. Going to go to 17. Are we going to see a Bolt or a Chain on the Sedge? Yeah, there's a Bolt on the Sedge. Now he can regenerate it, but then he has to sack the Lotus. This is a tough decision for D here. He is going to do it, it seems. So second loads for three black, regenerating the set troll. And there's a pass. But I think this is a good decision from Ron, right? Because the Black Lotus all of a sudden became a very good card after that Armageddon was being played out. So this is a very good move by Ron. And there's just a pass, so D is not finding any lands either. Let's see if... If Ron can do anything here. He's got the city. He's got the Mox Jet. Tapping both. Going to drop. Are we going to see a Disenchant? No, we're going to see a Chaos Orb here. Also good. He can flip next turn on the Setch Troll. So Ron is kind of managing. And D is not there yet. I mean, it was a good move. But asking here about the Vice, that is a very good point, though. He is taking his first point of damage from the vice. Ron dropping to 12. Now we're in the second main. There is a time walk. And he's keeping the ruby open. And he's playing a bolt on the life total of Ron. Ron dropping to 9 now. Ooh. It's getting dangerous. Ron is getting in the danger zone. Attacking again, he's going to drop to 7. And there's a pass. I think the positive thing here, at least for Ron, is that D is not finding any lands. At least that's something. Is he going to flip here? 
I mean, he can also wait. He could, of course, also flip on, for example, the Mox Ruby. Because then D no longer has access to direct damage. The good good news here for Ron again is that D doesn't have any white mana, so Ron doesn't have to worry about finding a disenchant in response to the activation of the Chaos Orb. So that is something. And these are really like crucial moments in the game. Ron being at 7, D still being at 20. Looks like he's about to tap the Mox Jet here, or not. He is, is that for an activation of the Chaos Orb? That is the big question. It would be great for Ron, of course, if he would have a Demonic Tutor in hand. And I mean, it's clear that, that Ron is in a difficult position, right? You know when you're playing like quick and in the flow, you know everything's going well, but then when you when you hit a bump, like after that Armageddon, then every decision is being being weighed on a scale. You really don't want to make a mistake. You want to try to stay in the game. Remember, this is a quarterfinal. He keeps looking at his hand. He's like, don't I have any better options? I would kind of love to know those those three cards now in hand by Ron to kind of know what decisions, what choices he is, is trying to make here. It almost looks like he can play out all three cards the way he's looking at them and he can also flip that those are the options. I mean, you know, if you have a bolt or a chain in hand, obviously you would, uh, you know, you would target the, uh, the set. Maybe he's got a balance in hand and he's wondering about that, but if he balances, Yes, he kills the Sedge, but he's also going to kill... Oh, we're going to see a move in response. We see a Psy Blast in response to the activation. So he's going to drop to 18 at 17, it seems. Was he on 19 then? And Ron's going to drop to 3. Oh, making it even harder for Ron here to make a decision. The decision that he has to make here is, do we... Do he want, does he want to flip, do we want, anyway, does he want to flip on the Setch Troll, taking care of the creature threat, or does he want to flip on the Mox Ruby, because after that Psy Blast, he's going to be on 3 life. He is going to flip on the Setch Troll, so he's taking the risk. I mean, it's kind of a catch-22 anyway. He is going to flip, he's kind of explaining why he's doing what he's doing, probably. And uh, let's see if he hits. Ooh, that is super close. Is it a hit? I wonder. I wonder if it's a hit. I guess it's a hit. No, it's not. It's not a hit. Oh, this is bad news. He just missed it. He just missed it. I think it's probably best. In hindsight, you always know best, right? But to keep the target, really put it in the middle of your own mat or something. This is so tough. And there's a side blast to seal the deal. So it wouldn't really have mattered that much. I guess if you yeah, if it would have hit the set, it wouldn't have mattered much. If it would have gone for, for example, the Mock Ruby, it would have given him one extra turn where he would have been on one life. So either way, after that Armageddon, that was of course the the, the changing moment in the game. It was gonna be really, really tough around. Both players are gonna dive into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go, and it's Ron on the play after losing that first one to that crucial Armageddon. Looks like both players are keeping their opening hand. Let's see what Ron is going to do. Just playing a Batlands, it seems, and a pass turn. That is fair, Magic Man. Just playing a land and go. I like that. I like the slow starts. I'm a fan of those, but I, I 
probably knowing D, he's going to start with some mocks. And there's a plateau. And yeah, there we go. Mox Pearl. And there is a Savannah line. So some early pressure here from D. I wonder if Ron's got a quick bolt here to respond. Or perhaps a chain in his own turn, of course. And he's going to draw for turn. Let's see what he can do. I think I saw a strip mine there in hand. Is that a disenchant as well? I'm not quite sure. If it is, he could consider kind of attacking the mana base of D, right? Disenchanting the Mox and stripping a land later. He could do both if he's got the right Mox in hand. Maybe he's... No, he's not doing anything, just passing turn. So again, a slow start here from Ron. We saw that in game one as well. There's the attack with the lines. Ron's going to drop to 18. D playing another land. There's a scrub land. Does he have a set stroll in hand? And if so, does he want to play it out? Rem remember, set stroll gets a plus one plus one bonus if you control a swamp. And uh, because D has that scrub land, it's a plains and a swamp, so he does. The problem, of course, is when you play it out for three mana, you don't have any mana open to actually regenerate it, so you're taking a little bit of a risk. Looks like he wants to play something. Changing his mind, though. I'm tapping again. Tapping two here. What is he going to do? There is a Chaos Orb. Interesting. And he's going to flip. Probably going to flip on the Badlands. The thing is, you first flip, and then you say, do you want to respond before um, telling your opponent what you want to flip on? So Ron has an opportunity to respond now. Doesn't, of course, have any white mana to play a disenchant, by the way. That's what he's missing. And if he's really in mana problems, then this flip could be devastating for him. Nothing he can do. He's just shoving his lands towards D. Obviously not happy with the way this whole match has been going so far. And uh, he is targeting the strip mine. And he's going to flip on it. Yeah, and the way this works, because maybe you're looking at this, you're thinking, but can he just, you know, tap and sack a strip money in response? No, you cannot. The moment that D says, I'm going to activate my Chaos Orb, you've got to make the decision how you want to respond before knowing the target. So if Ron would have sacked his strip mine to destroy a land on the side of D, then D simply could have chosen his Batlands to get destroyed instead. So there was really nothing Ron could do here. I think this was the good move. You don't want to lose both of your lands. So let's see if uh, if Ron can find another land. Okay, that's at least good news for him, finding a, a City of Brass. And passing turn. So no Atok, for example, for Ron here. And still no Bolt or other solution for the Savannah lines. I mean, he's still an 18. He's got time. Let's see what D can do. They're attacking for two first. Now we're going to see a bolt. Okay, there's a bolt on the line. And I believe D's got five cards in hand. Or could there be six in there? It's kind of hard to see. And, ooh, playing a Mind Twist for two. So D seems to be low on mana. Missed his land drop this turn. There we see a shuffle up by Ron, so there's going to be a Mind Twist for two. What two cards is he going to pick? Those two. There is a Mox Sapphire. Ooh, that's actually pretty good. And a Mind Twist! Ho oh, ho! That Mind Twist would have been really good for Ron. Ron is devastated. He's like, oh man, I can't believe I can be so unlucky. Because both of these cards would have been great next turn. Shaking the hand there. And, uh, and Ron's also known as Mr. Mind Twist because he usually twists you whenever you play against, against him at least once each match. He's twisted me a lot of times. There's a draw and a go. But losing that Mox is also very painful here. There's a Savannah Alliance and a go. Or is there going to be another bolt here by Ron? Yeah, there's another bolt. Quickly taking care of the lion. 
Tapping to this. Uh, oh, Shatter. Interesting. Shatter on the Mox. So both players having two lands now and no threats on the board. Quite interesting. There's another land. And just a pass. And a pass by Ron as well. So both players kind of in top decking mode, but it looks like D is doing a little bit better finding the lands he needs. If he now has a set troll, he can play it and protect it with black mana open to regenerate. And that's exactly what he does. And this is a problem now for Ron. Oh man. This is a problem. Now he's got a 3-3 regenerating troll staring at him. He's low on mana. There's a pass. Oh, this is bad news for Ron. There's the attacks. He's going to drop to 14. Again, another land. So D's really good with finding the lands. No Sarah Angel. Of course, he probably wants to keep regeneration mana open for the set as well. And it looks like D just has to pass, or sorry, Ron just has to pass turn again. Really not finding any lands at this crucial moment in the game. Dropping to 11. It's looking very bad for Ron here. And I, I think when he's starting to get low enough. Okay, at least there's a lead. Come on, Ron, do something here. And Ron staring down at his hand. He's on 11. He's got the 3-3 three, three set troll to take care of. And at this point, the City of Brass is starting to hurt more as well. And Ron really being in the tank, you're trying to find a way out. A balance would be nice. I mean, he would lose some cards, but it would mean D would lose his creature and a lot of lands. Tapping three, not too happy about it, it seems. Going to 10. What can he do? There is a Blood Moon. Yeah, I mean, it's not, at least it makes the set troll now a 2-2. Two -two. And there's of course still a moment where D can respond. So perhaps he's got a disenchant in hand here, floating white mana. And you can see Ron already taking the Blood Moon away. Yeah, there's the disenchant. Yeah, so what happens is in response to the cast of the Blood Moon, uh, D already taps down his white source, so he's got a white mana floating. Are we going to see a Psy Blast on the life total? Yep, Psy Blast on the life total. Going to go to six. I think it's over, to be honest. I think I think we're going to see an attack here dropping to three and then probably a bolt. Or Yeah, there's the bolt. Right, it's going to go to three. Attack with the Setch. That's it. That's it. Oh, man. You know, Rod, I feel your deck didn't shine. Luckily, we saw it earlier uh, playing a really entertaining game against a green Stompy deck. Uh, and I also want to congratulate D again. Again, a marvelous result with your core set deck. And you're not done yet. You're going to advance to the semifinals. That is just fantastic news. Oh, man. What a match. A 2-0 win by the core deck from D. And here you see the decks that are going to battle it out in the semifinals. So that's going to be up on the next Timmy Talks episode. So we've got Dion's two to core deck taking on a line dip brew by Baptiste. And that promises to be a thriller of a match that you do not want to miss. So make sure you subscribe and ring that bell. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you for your support and for all your views here at the channel. Um, before you go, I would just like to ask you to do three simple things. First of all, like this video, that would just be great. Leave a comment here as well. And if you want to share this video on your socials, these things are completely free and they really, really help Timmy Talks move forward. They help the channel grow. And, uh, and yeah, I would just really, really appreciate it if you would take a moment to do those three things. Then there's one last thing you can do, and that is you can become a patron of the channel. Then you really become part of the channel, a sponsor, a supporter of Timmy Talks. And how does that work? Well, actually quite simple. There's probably an info card popping up right now. If you click on an info card, that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And there you can read all about how you can support my channel. It already starts with $1 a month. And the cool thing is you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. 
um, you know, you get access to all the online Timmy Talks events and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? Well, this end scroll. Let's take a look at our fantastic, wunderbar, amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Here we go. Ik het als fikker te samba kan zien. 